following message is presented by Community Gospel Church in Bremen, Indiana. It is our great privilege to share this ministry with you. We in no way intend for this to be a replacement for the local church. It is our prayer that this would serve as a resource to help make Jesus Christ known in our congregation and other congregations gathering across the world. For more information about Community Gospel Church, visit www.communitygospelchurch.com. If you would, open up your Bible or electronic device that has a Bible on it. We are in the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3. Uh, Big numbers are going to be the chapters. Smaller numbers are going to be the verses. If you can't find something in your Bible, you can, by all means, use the table of contents. If somebody sitting next to you makes fun of you for using the table of contents, you find a different seat. That's how it works. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 is where we're at this morning. We're landing the plane. If this is your first Sunday to Community Gospel, welcome. Um, We'll catch you up to speed. Uh, If you would like to go back and listen to previous messages, you can do so, communitygospelchurch.com, and you can click on the message tab. Uh, We've been uh, preaching uh, 1 and 2 Thessalonians for um, a few months, and we're moving into the Advent season, so uh, we're actually going to cherry pick a few verses in the Bible, and we're going to preach on those. There are going to be some familiar verses uh, that you uh, have probably heard or um, have read uh, for the next four weeks. Uh, Pastor John is going to um, close out our year for the last Sunday, um, coming uh, to preach on um, a psalm, and then uh, 2024. Is that crazy? Isn't that just sound so weird? 2024. I still write 2020 on stuff. Uh, But 2024, we're moving into the book of Genesis. And it just seems like um, a good place for us to look at the beginning and what God has done. So we're going to just visit uh, very familiar uh, favorite passages of Scripture in regards to Genesis. So uh, we'll look at that next year. But let's do Advent before that. And let's Talk about Second Thessalonians chapter three. Before that, Second Thessalonians. If you look at the bold headings uh, in chapter one and move to chapter three, you will see that our author Paul um, has written this letter to the church that is gathered at Thessalonica. Now, back in the New Testament, they didn't have community gospels. They didn't have uh, fellowship churches or crossroads or uh, any of these fun names. They just had churches that met in the town. So the church that met in the town was called that church. So this is Thessalonia or the church of the Thessalonians. And so Paul is writing because he is a church planner. He is with, as we've talked about before, two other individuals. He's with some church planting buddies, if you will. He's with Silas, or Silvanius, as is called in First Thessalonians, and then a young man named Timothy. And all of these brothers have planted this church, and they have gratitude for the believers that are gathering there because they are not only faithful to the gospel that they have received, but they love each other really well. The gospel is simple. It is the fact that Christ came, Christ died, Christ rose again. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you are ushered into the family of God. And here, Paul and Silas and Timothy realize that these individuals not only have accepted that gospel, the good news, but they are so passionate about sharing it with people who are present in their everyday life. They can't stop talking about Jesus and who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And so as they continue to communicate about Jesus, persecution, problems, and pain come up. Let me just tell you something. If you talk about Jesus a lot, things are going to get sticky in your life. Not in a bad way, in a good way, because the Bible tells us, consider all your trials and tribulations pure joy. Easy to say, harder to do because these brothers and sisters are looking at all their oppressors and they're wondering what we all wonder when is God going to strike them down when's God going to come and is he going to do anything if he's this great judge is he going to come and rescue us in our persecution and pain for the gospel that we have received Paul says yeah he's coming he says and not only is he coming he's going to judge and he's going to give you rest 
So he's given all this counsel to these Thessalonians. He's talked about false teachers. He's talked about standing firm in the faith. He's talked about discipline and supporting one another. And now, with all of these teachings given, with all of these commands given, Paul looks at this beloved church and he says, let's carry out these truths in our everyday life. In other words, what you hear on Sunday church is not just for Sunday morning. It's for Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. Christianity is never supposed to be compartmentalized. In other words, we don't just talk about Jesus on Sunday and then put him in a box and shelf our Bibles on Monday. We're just as adamant in the pursuit of Christ on Sunday as we are on Monday as we are on Tuesday. When we become believers, we are striving to conform all of our lives to the image of Jesus. And so Paul looks at it and he says, let's close out this letter and let's pray for the joy of the Lord to permeate all of your being, even though you're experiencing a massive amount of persecution. Let's let God's peace, his genuine peace and joy permeate in every area of your life and that you would not forget the grace that you have received. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all of our sins. So we look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and we start with verse 16, and we see three ways the joy of the Lord is manifested in our life. In other words, manifest is just a word made known, or that we see it. How do we see the joy of the Lord in our everyday life? Well, let's look at verse 16. Now, in other words, everything I just said. Now, may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. This is Paul praying for not only the church at Thessalonica, but he's also praying the same prayer for all the churches in the region. And he doesn't know it, but it's also a prayer for all of the churches who are gathered today. He says, may the Lord of peace Himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord, we are asking him to be with all of you. So the first thing that you see in verse 16, the way that the joy of the Lord is made manifest is in peace. God's peace. Revelation tells us that people will cry, peace, peace, and there will be no peace. So what's the difference between the world's peace or claiming to have peace and our peace As believers, good question. Paul ends 2 Thessalonians, if you want to, let's jump over just a couple of chapters and look at the similarities between chapter 3, verse 16, and chapter 1, verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What a good pastor Paul is. He starts his sermon and then he ends his sermon in ways that people could understand. We'll talk about grace in just a few minutes, but let's talk about this word peace. Now, we do what is called word studies when we study scripture. In the Old Testament, we realize the original Old Testament was written in Hebrew, so Hebrew words are important. And then you have Greek in the New Testament, and the Greek words are important. So in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. It's such a fun word to say. Would you say shalom? Actually, the Holy Walk's coming up Friday and Saturday. If you haven't uh, put that on your calendars to attend, you're going to hear that in the reenactment of um, Jesus' advent or coming. You're going to hear shalom. And some people will say shalom, shalom, which means total peace. It's like the first peace didn't set, so we're going to give you another peace, right? It's like saying good morning, good morning. (laughs) And here, the Hebrew word peace or shalom refers to a relationship With God, yes, but also with man. If we go back into the Ten Commandments, we realize the first four are written for our relationship with God, and the second six are written in our relationship with man. So when we say shalom, or we hear the word shalom, it's may you have peace with God, and may you have peace with your brothers and sisters. And here it is a covenant. God promises when we have a relationship with him, and a relationship with his church, jumping into the New Testament, those who have confessed and believed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he wants us to realize it's a gift to be obedient to him and to one another. Isaiah chapter 48, the prophet says, there is no peace for the wicked. So the world that is out there 
we would look at if they say, well, I just have peace, and they don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we would say they don't really have peace. They are in a state of delusion. Isaiah predicted Jesus the Messiah would be the prince of shalom. He would be the prince of peace. He would give totality of peace to all people who believe upon his name. Saul, our author, also called Paul, was an Old Testament scholar. He took what he knew shalom to mean, brought it into the Greek pagan world, and calls it, ready for this, Irene. He takes shalom and puts it into the Greek, and he says, I want the word peace to be Irene, meaning rest, and this is kind of secular, but it's not, we had it first, tranquility. In other words, you can be at ease, you can be still, you can be at peace when you have a relationship with God through faith in Christ. Now let's put that in the context of what Paul just said with his prayer in verse 16. In other words, Paul is praying the Thessalonian believers cling to their peace with God through Christ's work of justification on the cross. If you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with God through faith in Christ, you have no peace. This is the perfect season to come to relationship with God through faith and trust in Christ. Now, we, we understand that so many of us have a relationship with God through faith in Christ. We are believers. We're children of God. But yet we don't access this peace, this Irene. We look at it and we realize that there are things that are transpiring in our world. And we wonder to ourselves, how can God give us peace if everything is so all over the place? Well, our peace does not come from looking at what's outside. It comes from remembering what dwells inside. And so here, Paul says, may the Lord of peace, the one who gives you the ability to be still and know that he is God, in any season of life, he satisfies your every need. Thomas Watson says it like this. It's a great, uh, uh, essentially, paraphrase of this passage. He says, if God be our God, he will give us peace in trouble. When there is a storm without, that means in the world, he will make peace within. The world can create trouble in peace, but God can create peace in trouble. That's reassuring. That's reassuring to us as we look at the trials and tribulations that we face. Paul knew the commands. He'd given uh, more than human effort to fulfill so he looks at his beloved church and he thinks to themselves, he's like, I wonder what they would say to that. <laughs> and the church would look at it and they'd say, Paul, we can't do that. We've tried to do that. Have you ever been in that boat? Somebody looks at you and gives you what's called a Sunday school answer. By the way, Sunday school answers are good when they're in Sunday school. But when you get into life, Sunday school answers just don't seem to suffice. It's easy to say Sunday school answers. It's harder to live out Sunday school answers. And Paul realizes, if you go back into the context of what he just said, that there were idle people in the church. It would be hard for them to humble themselves. It would hard, it'd be hard for those people, chapter 3, verse 6 through 11, to get back to work. It would be hard for annoyed believers to treat people lovingly with a firm hand. Paul didn't expect the Thessalonians to do anything on their own strength, so he prays the Lord of peace, go back to verse 16, give peace at all times in every way. You know what that's saying? Not a dependency on your own power, but a dependency upon the Holy Spirit who dwells within you's power. So what Paul says is God's peace is, that he gives to us doesn't mean there will be absence of conflict. Some of you experienced that firsthand at Thanksgiving. You thought to yourself, it got real crazy, Pastor Jordan. Thanksgiving got real. Turkey got thrown. Stuffing was on the floor. I did not have peace. You could have, knowing that God is in control. God's peace gives us confident assurance that in any situation, we do not need to be afraid. Believers have peace, and the Lord himself gives peace by filling us with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a powerful combination to tackle anything. So you're looking at me, and you're thinking to yourself, can you make it practical? Yeah, that's what I do. So let's talk about how to make this practical. 
Three applications regarding God's peace and how to have it in your life when the turkey gets thrown and the stuffing's on the floor. How to have peace when conflict comes or conflict arises. How to have peace when work situations go all over the place. How to have peace when your kids do things that you don't want them to do. How to have peace when it's snowing outside. (laughs) Number one, peace has to be sought. It has to be sought. God commands us to seek peace. The psalmist seeks peace. You cannot have peace unless you seek it. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. If you want peace, you have to seek it. We should make every effort, Romans chapter 14, to do what leads to peace. And there will be people, just let me tell you, that do not desire peace But we still do our best to be at peace with God and with others. Romans chapter 12 says, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. And that's not just the people that you like. You are called to seek being peaceful people. Having the absence of conflict in regards to the internal self. Which goes to the second thing. The peace of God should rule your heart. This is a great opportunity for us today to examine what really has the throne of our heart. Believers have an obligation to let the peace of God rule. What that means is that I have to make a choice on whether I'm going to think that I'm better than God or I'm going to allow God to be better than me. Here, Paul says, you have a choice. You can either trust God's promise. Now I go back to Romans 8, 28. That God is working for the good of those who love him. That situations and circumstances are working for the good of those who love the Lord. Or I can rely on myself and reject the peace that he offers. So let me just walk you through this a little bit. Whatever season or situation you find yourself in, you have a choice. Either you're going to choose to be at peace knowing God is in control Or you're going to reject that and say, I know better than God. It's a choice. You always have a choice. You cannot control other people, but you can control yourself. And when we let the Spirit control us, that means that the peace of God, we are choosing to rule in our hearts. Just like Jesus gave his disciples peace based on the truth that he overcame the world in John 14... He does the same with us. We also know that peace is part of the fruit of the Spirit. So if you take Jesus' words, the fruit of the Spirit, and what Paul says here to the Thessalonians, we realize that if we're allowing the Spirit of God to rule or take residence in our hearts and lives, we'll experience God's peace. We have chosen to be peaceful. Romans chapter 8, verse 6 is on the screens. Let Your sinful nature control your mind and it leads to death. But let the spirit control your mind. It leads to life and peace. Now, let me just give you a really practical way to live this out in your everyday walk with Jesus. You do not have to respond like that to anything at any time. Very rarely, I will say, if ever, does something need to be made decisively in a split second. There is, for the most part, 99% of the time, times when we can take a step back, we can relax, ask God to put us at peace, and help us to remain focused on that which is important. There are too many of us, far too many of us, who make decisions based off of our emotions, and when our emotions take over, our logic ceases. The response that you want to make needs to wait. The thing that you would have loved to say, some of you uh, are experiencing this firsthand, you're like, I wish I wouldn't have said that yesterday or at Thanksgiving. If only I would have waited and asked for God to give me peace. That's why we pray, by the way. This is why we spend time talking to God. We should always talk to God before we talk to man. And when we do that, Paul says, you can trust that the Lord will work. <laughs> I was talking to an individual the other day, and they came up to me and they said, my prayer worked. I said, I said what? He said, yeah, I prayed, asked God for something, and he did it. 
Now, I'm immediately thinking, like, you asked him for $100 or, you know, whatever the case was. I said, no, I asked him just to put me at peace, and, and uh, it was a big conflict, and something was transpiring at work, and I just stopped, and I just said, God, I feel like I'm out of control. Put me back in control. And he's like, and I was. <laughs> I said, it's amazing. This thing works, right? So here, what Paul says is, you have to trust that that's going to happen and take place. Since Jesus made it possible for us to have peace with God through faith, you can never forget that he is our peace now and forever. I think sometimes we get saved and we think to ourselves, well, that's it. There's God's greatest work in my life. He's all done. It's the start of great work. It is a fantastic, I would say, coming to know the Lord as Savior is is fantastic, top of the list. But now we take what's at the top of the list and we put it in every other part of the list. So here, Paul says, this world is going to have wars, it's going to have conflicts until Christ comes to establish his true and lasting peace. But the question is on the table. First and foremost, if you are not a believer, have you entered into God's peace through faith in Christ? We cannot share our peace unless we have let it rule our hearts. And if you are a believer, then are you a publisher of peace Or are you an agent of destruction? See, we have to ask ourselves all the time, what do I promote? Do I promote godliness and peace or do I promote destruction? Husbands, you should think about that in regards to your home with your family. Same with wives. Same with our children. We should ask ourselves, am I constantly seeking the other person's best as God has sought my best on the cross? Or am I only concerned about my own well-being? The great Apostle Paul looks at a church that he loves and he said, now, this is a prayer from his heart. This has no selfish motives in it whatsoever. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. He wants it to be well. It is well with my soul. He's asking the church, is it well with your soul? And if it's not well with your soul, he looks at the church and he says, it might be your fault. Now, he moves in to verse 17. And he says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Now, (laughs) if you understand anything about New Testament letters, this is outstanding because somebody in the church, I can hear them in the back row go, Paul didn't write that. (laughs) It's kind of like when somebody looks at it and says, pastor didn't say that, right? God didn't say that. That's the worst, by the way. You're trying to correct somebody in love and they look at you and be like, the Bible doesn't say that. Or they do it the other way. They're like, well, the Bible says, and I'm like, I don't think we're reading the same Bible. But Paul says in a very genuine way, watch this. He says, I write this greeting with my own hand a sign of my genuineness. He's saying, I don't say these things because I hate you. I say these things because I love you. And it is the way that I write. Paul is speaking in a very loving way. And he usually dictated his letters to a scribe and would often end his mail with a handwritten note in his own handwriting. He does this in 1 Corinthians, by the way, chapter 16, Galatians, Colossians, the end of Philemon, he does this. And he does this for a few reasons. Number one, there were a couple people who thought that uh, Paul was writing things that weren't of God. And so this is a way he kind of pushes back against the false teachers. He writes this greeting with his own hand, which guarantees his readers that false teachers weren't writing letters. And that was a concern if you look at chapter 2, verse 2. It's possible that false teachers sent letters to the Thessalonian church with Paul's forged signatures. You know it's getting bad when people are forging your sermons. (laughs) And here, Paul says, like he did in Romans chapter 3, he mentions the false claims about his teachings. He talks about it in Colossians and in Philemon, and he makes a point of noting that he's personally inscribing these words. It's genuine. So the first way that Paul looks at the church, and he says, I want to see joy manifest in your life. That's peace. But also, I want you to understand that it comes from being genuine. He gives a personal touch to be genuine. Sometimes Paul dictated his letters to a trusted companion, and he attached a few closing remarks in his own handwriting, showing people that he was genuinely concerned for them. There was nothing in it for him. 
It was all for the glory of God to be manifested and made known to the people who were all over the place. Now, dictating letters was a common practice in the ancient day. You had a writing assistant uh, known as Amanesis. In Romans 16, 22, it says, I, Tereotis, and the one writing this letter for Paul. So we see that happen. And we wonder, okay, so Paul, why insert it here in the text? Why look at that? Why is that so important when you talked about peace and then you're going to talk about grace and you sandwich that in between that? Why is that important? Well, just as the Thessalonians would have been glad to see Paul's signature close the letter because they knew that he cared about them, and he knew, they knew that he wanted their best, we must be genuine believers as well. In other words, if you are going to this season promote peace and grace of God, and you're going to let peace rule and reign in your heart, you have to be genuine about it. You have to be compassionate about it. People hear your tone and they understand if you're really, truly genuine or not. The joy of the Lord flows through a genuine believer who is concerned about the lost and his fellow believers. My question for you is, are you genuine? Can I hear your genuineness? I see more and more people who are trying to pummel the gospel on people in our society to get them to come into the kingdom instead of looking at them and showing them what an awesome opportunity it is to have a relationship with God through faith in Christ. If anything, Paul is so genuine because he says, when I am genuine in my relationship with God and my relationship with you, I experience joy. I see this manifest in our church all the time. You guys will tell each other the craziest things in the hallway. Like you, you don't understand. Like We hear that stuff right? And I love it because you're like, oh, girl, let me tell you what happened yesterday. Oof, man, my kids were just all over the place at Thanksgiving. I was about ready to get out of the rod and beat them children. And I'm going, this is our church? <laughs> and then the other person looked back and goes, like, I'll just pray for you. I'll pray for you right now. And I'm like, oh, man, we, we are some twisted people, right? <laughs> but the more genuine we are, it seems that the more God works in that genuineness, the more we open up and the more we show our transparency, the more the gospel is made manifest. So Paul says, hey, the joy of the Lord flows from peace. It flows from genuineness. It flows from all these things. And he says, as he closes the letter, he says, now let's talk about grace. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand, a sign of genuineness in every letter of mine, the way I write, you be genuine, I'll be genuine, because the grace of our Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, be with you you all. So he says, in God's peace and being genuine and in God's grace, we see the joy of the Lord made manifest. Now let's talk about grace for just a second. Paul's giving final benediction, closing here, calling for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to be over and in all of the Thessalonian believers. Now, if you would, just highlight something real quick in the text. Circle that word, or. Notice that's a personal relationship that he and the Thessalonians had with Jesus. They belonged to him, but in a real sense, Paul also belonged to them. They were a family, big family, okay? And here in the text, God's grace through faith joined them together here and now and also for eternity. Now, you got to define grace, all right? In the New Testament, grace is the word charis. People name their kids this all the time, by the way. It's always funny to see a kid named Karis who doesn't act like a (laughs) Karis. But it means favor or blessing or kindness. Everyone can extend grace, but when Karis is used in connection with God, it means God chose to bless us rather than curse us for our sins. Karis is the unmerited favor of God as we didn't do anything to earn it, and it is available to us always. If I had a case... And it had $1,000 in it. And I opened up that case and I said, here, it's available to you. And you looked at it and said, that's, that's a lot of money. I like that money. But you didn't take it. That would be a rejection of what I want to give you. God gives us grace in abundance. He opens up the case of grace and he says, here, take some of it. And a lot of times we look at it and we say, well, I, I don't really need that. I don't really want that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm doing pretty good by myself. And he's like, how's that working out for you? 
And he says, this is available to you right now. This is totally accessible for you at this moment. You can take it however you want. Now, the funny thing is, the people who come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior abuse grace often. You do it, I do it, we all do it. There comes a time in your life where you look at it and you say, well, I'm going to do this because God is going to forgive me. And you're going to say, his grace is in abundance, right? He'll forgive this sin. Okay, well, he might, but Paul says, just because... I know the right thing to do, and I don't do it. I shouldn't abuse that grace. I should look at it and say, do I continue to go and sin? By no means. I don't continue to sin just because I know grace is in abundance. Well, what do I do? I put that grace into action. God's grace isn't given just to sit dormant until the day of redemption. God's grace is given to strengthen you, first and foremost, and then enable you to endure under trials and tribulations, among many other things. Grace is being constantly given to God's people so that we receive it and then give it back out. Receive it and give it back out. What does this mean in our everyday life? It means, hold on church, that there's some people that you just met last week and you did not give them grace. It means maybe there's some people in this room that you have not given the same grace that God has given to you. And Paul says we have to be great grace getters and great grace givers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, a church that was not doing well, by the way, Paul is going through a difficult trial, and he prays that God would remove a thorn in the flesh. And God said no, but assured Paul that his grace was sufficient for him. Now, this is really interesting because in 2 Timothy chapter 2, remember, that's Paul's companion, and he's with him. They're all planting churches together, right? Paul tells Timothy that divine grace strengthens us. It also comes up in the book of Titus, chapter 2. Titus, chapter 2, verse 11 says that God's grace trains us to renounce ungodliness, back to a choice. We renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and we live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. That's now waiting for our blessed hope, that's Jesus, the appearance of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So track with me here. Peace is a choice. Genuineness is a choice. Grace is a choice. But the crazy thing about grace is we do not discover God's grace. It is in relentless pursuit of us. Grace relentlessly pursues us. Grace is God giving the greatest treasure to the least deserving, which is every single one of us. What a setup for Advent as we look at next week. Like what an absolutely fantastic concept. Paul closes with a prayer of God's grace being with all the Thessalonians as a reminder and a call. Never forget the kindness of God in offering salvation to you and the unbelievable gift of forgiveness that you have received and need to give. We have out in the foyer tables with cards, Christmas cards to our missionaries. If you do me a favor and sign that card, that'd be fantastic and tell them that you're praying for them and do me a favor, really pray for them. But every time that you sign your name, would you realize that you are called to be a missionary as well? Wherever the place that God has put you and populated you, You are in full-time ministry. You are not just a grace getter, you're a grace giver. So the same benediction here is the same one in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 28, except Paul adds the word all. So that word all, that's a final petition for unity in the church by being obedient to the instruction and commands that were given by God, implemented individually and collectively as a whole. Church. Why do we exist? To make Christ known near and far. What does that mean? That means this season, we extend peace in a genuine way, and we also extend grace. In the home, which is the greatest mission field, and also in the workplace, and also in the other places that you populate. And I would just ask, how are we doing in that? How is that working out? It's the exact same call that Jesus gave. Paul is so unoriginal in this passage. It's the exact same command that Jesus gave when he said, go and sin no more to those who received his grace. When Jesus healed people 
And they looked at him and they were so thankful. They said, what do I do now? Jesus said, go and sin no more. Don't live in the ways that you used to live. Live renewed, redeemed, restored. You have to do the same to know the joy of the Lord. We close with this. Some of you may not be experiencing the joy of the Lord because you are harboring and selfishly containing God's grace, being genuine and peaceful. Some of us have problems because we look at God's grace and God's peace and we say to ourselves, it's mine. And it's, you're right, it is. But your cup needs to overflow so that you can give that same grace and peace that was given to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this study and First and Second Thessalonians. What a meaningful passage for those of us who are really good at giving and extending your peace and your grace in a very genuine way. And some of us are finding ourselves persecuted for that. Family members don't want to participate in the gospel that we have received. People who are present in our everyday lives are pushing back and we're finding ourselves in a state of frustration and we wonder, where are you, Lord? And you remind us that you're working on our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to continue to remain faithful to the gospel that we have received. I pray, God, that you would give your people gathered here today peace and that you would help them to see that grace is being lavished upon them in abundance. And you are doing so in a truly genuine way like Paul was doing in his writing to the Thessalonian church. God, as we look forward to the Advent season, may we remember that you assured us of final victory. The season that we're experiencing right now is just a breath. It's just a vapor. It's just a mist. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. And so help us to live responsibly despite difficult situations. To keep our eyes fixated on the fact that Christ did come and that Christ is coming again. That's more than just a doctrine, God. It is a promise. It's not just for the future. It has a vital impact on how we live here today. I pray, Lord, in this season, that the joy of the Lord would permeate our entire being. That you would restore us back to the joy of our salvation. Renew a right spirit within us. Help us to realize that we have the opportunity and the obligation to go and make disciples of all nations. To those who are right in front of us, to those that are a little bit beyond our reach, and even to the ends of the earth. We prepare, Lord, for Advent by not compartmentalizing our faith, but living these truths out as we go from this place. It's in your name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Thank you for listening to the Community Gospel Church Podcast. If you would like to support this ministry financially, simply log on to communitygospelchurch.com and click the Contribute tab.